Off a Linear Circle, Part 1, Chapter 9, Defense. The elves bring back his clothes on Saturday, along with a small bag of fabric scraps. Wearing them feels odd, but not as odd as the damned pants. That's why, Nazar says to Filky, who is eyeing him like he's about to blaspheme her work. The pants are to protect against zippers. What a stupid idea. He does see how they could be useful, but it takes the entire damned weekend to get used to the sensation of two layers of cloth at his hips. He is still not impressed with the 20th century. The roster for those attending his classes arrives with lunch. He unrolls it, curious, and wonders that it seems so short. He counts the names while trying to consume a sandwich and not lose half of its filling, and is scowling by the time he's done. 281 students, once he includes those aren't scheduled for those who aren't scheduled for any WT classes. Nazar finishes lunch and then apparates down to a shadowy corner of Severus's office after making sure no students are lurking in the room. Nazar announces himself. Severus glances up from the paperwork on his desk. You could knock on the door like a normal human being. I could, but I really wanted an answer to this question. Nazar replies. Severus, why are there only 281 students in this entire school? Ah, Severus puts down his quill. War paranoia. Well over half of Britain's magical children are being sent to other schools to Europe, rather than risk Hogwarts, even though the Dark Lord's return is merely a rumored threat. 300 students was normal in my day. Nazar leans against the closest wall. Granted, we were hosting for the Northern Kingdoms, the Kingdoms in the Iberian Peninsula, and the Holy Roman Empire. And that's taking into consideration the fact that many magical children were still schooled at home. The idea that Hogwarts is hosting less than 300 students in this era is mind-boggling. Severus nods. I am selfish enough to be glad the number is low. Teaching that many students is still a lot of work. I assume you won't find it a hardship, then. No. I was mentally preparing for triple that number based on what I've heard about Britain's population size. Nazar sighs. Right. Sorry for barging in. I need to go. He waves the roster around. Deal with this? Severus glances down at the scroll he's been obliterating with red ink. I would like to have some warning, perhaps by Patronus, but I don't m mind your arrival by apparition. Nazar hesitates. My Patronus does not make many people happy. Now I am intrigued. Severus folds his hands under his chin. What is it? Nazar casts the charm and smiles, and the basilisk Patronus appears in front of Severus's desk. The basilisk is almost as tall as the archways in the office. Thank you for warning me. Severus is even paler than usual. Thus I expected something horrible by modern standards, and you did not disappoint. This is what Kaza will resemble in 100 years, Nazar says, running his hand along the dry mist sensation of a corporeal Patronus. But this is not the only thing bothering you. Severus shakes his head. No, the Dark Lord has some somehow acquired a very large pit viper, that is. He frowns at Nazar's Patronus. Perhaps half the size of that. She is capable of eating grown men alive, and unfortunately I've borne witness to it. It isn't pleasant. Well, my Patronus won't eat you, and a true basilisk won't eat humans. They claim we taste terrible, Nazar says. You didn't mention anything about a giant snake before. It was a very recent acquaintance. The Sunday before Halloween, amid the Dark Lord's ideas regarding after-midnight festivities. I've been a bit preoccupied since then. Nazar allows his Patronus to fade. No, I suppose it isn't every day that someone falls out of a painting and disrupts your life. Disrupts? Severus looks at him as if he said something exceptionally daft. Oh no, my friend, whose company I enjoy, is no longer trapped in a portrait. However, shall I cope? By drowning yourself in sarcasm, I suppose, Nazar says. Shall I apparate down to your quarters at 9.30 this evening? We will keep the rumor mill to a dull roar. The Zabini appear to show tact for once. As of yet, there are no rumors flying about concerning you except for how evil you plan to be come Monday morning. Severus smirks at him. Did you finally decide Muggle Fic to give Muggle Fiction another go? Someone stuffed a copy of Bram Stoker's Dracula in with the magical fiction. Pretty certain that man was not a magician, but I always wanted to read the book, especially with 
All of the vampire jokes flying about in recent years, Nazar says. Severus lets out an amused snort. I am not a vampire, Nazar. Nazar grins. No, but I hope you do like fighting. Severus regards him curiously. You are aware that you said that out loud, yes? Nazar turns his grin into a look of profound in- innocence. Which part, he asks, and operates back to his office upstairs. Severus finds himself staring at the place Nazar just vacated. That was that was indir- an indirect, yet very effective means of announcing intent. He has no intentions of pursuing such yet, and he doubts Nazar will either, not when it hasn't even been a full week since Halloween. It is nice to know that when he does decide to investigate that possibility, the attempt will not be unwelcome. They have known each other for 24 years, after all. If that isn't enough basis for some attempt at a relationship, then Severus truly does not know what else could possibly qualify. Nazar is prompt, and arrives in Severus's quarters at 9.30 that evening. You didn't bring the book, Severus asks. No, not right now. Nazar flops down on his sofa and leans his head back so he can stare at the ceiling. Do you have that flaming alcoholic nonsense? The one you were complaining about? Severus studies the man, who seems to have completely exhausted himself between noon and now. What did you do? Oh, duplicating books. I refuse to teach a class without giving students something to read, and it isn't going to be those rubbish textbooks they were assigned. Some of them only learn the concept behind the spell work about by reading it, anyway. Nazar scrubs his face with both hands. I haven't done anything like that in a long time. You do realize we make students buy their own textbooks, yes? Nazar glares at him. Yes, and I told you in 1973 that it was a stupid fucking rule when there are teachers in this school capable of casting a basic duplication spell. Severus shakes his head and pours two glasses after retrieving the bottle. Nazar, I only know that spell because you told me of its existence when I started teaching. It isn't taught at Hogwarts. Who do I kill to rectify that blunder? He hands Nazar a glass. Lucius Malfoy. Nazar swallows half of the fire whiskey at once. I am fine with that. Draco Malfoy might not be, Severus points out, watching Nazar make a face over the taste. I will repeat that you're not that you're meant to savor that, not drown yourself in it. Nazar doesn't smile. If war breaks out, most of them are going to lose at least one parent. Never mind. Now I want to drown myself in it, Severus mutters. Nazar regards the rest of the alcohol in the glass. Their parents chose to side with Voldemort, discovered the reality, and decided to go along with it anyway. There are 281 students in Hogwarts who can still choose otherwise. Severus eyes him and decides to change the subject. Are you nervous about Monday? No, I'm frustrated, which is infinitely worse since I've yet to teach a single class. Nazar frowns. I don't think Monday is going to improve things. Why do you think I wanted the job? Nazar smiles at him and finishes the fire whiskey. If I'm frustrated, then you would kill the lot of them. Absolute nonsense, Severus replies. Neville Longbottom wouldn't be melting cauldrons. That child has melted more cauldrons in a potions class than anyone else in the history of this school, and I'm probably being literal, Nazar says. You know, aside from Longbottom's full-fledged terror of you, maybe you're looking at it the wrong way. Not letting him brew it all, Severus asks flatly. Nazar rolls his eyes. He isn't getting the assigned potion correct, but to melt his bloody cauldron that many times, he is doing something else very right. The destructive capability is something that could be harnessed. It just needs to be led away from standard potions. Severus stares at Nazar for a moment. It's an intriguing idea, but will only succeed if Longbottom can mentally function for long enough for Severus to figure out what just what in the hell he's doing. I'll think on it. Monday morning at breakfast, Nazar is properly introduced to the school at large. Dumbledore is entirely accurate as to his origins while still being amusingly vague about the entire process, which is entertaining. Nazar knows that man was not a Slytherin, but he fakes it very well. Nazar stands up and waves when prompted, and then sits deck down beside Minerva McGonagall and Aurora Sinstra. After listening to the whispers, he leans closer to McGonagall. They keep saying I'm hot. Does that mean I'm on fire and just haven't realized it yet? McGonagall's lips twitch. 
It's modern slang that's been creeping in from overseas, Professor Slytherin. They're calling you handsome. Nazar grimaces and tries not to lean away from the table. Oh, that's great. Concerned about teaching, Aurora asks, sounding a touch vicious. Teaching? No, I just don't want them to flirt with me. Laying aside that I'm a thousand years old, I am also 42 years old. A student flirting with me is creepy and so very unwanted. Also, most of the ones whispering, whispering about it are girls. Not into dalliances with women, or is that inappropriate again? People couldn't make up their minds a few centuries back if gender was important or not, which is stupid, because it wasn't a problem a thousand years ago at all. It is inappropriate. It, is, it isn't inappropriate, merely useful for gossip fodder, McGonagall replies. I like you already, Nazar says, which earns him a faint smile. He can charm people. He can also kill people. But verbal defense is an art form, and he is good at it. He does lean back in his chair to be able to see Sephiris. How have I not heard temperature-related slang in the common room before now? Sephiris smirks at Minerva. Because my Slytherins have more dignity than to begin using every bit of new slang they trip over on the street. And of course, it being a muggle word, Aurora mutters. Oh no! The horror! Nazar Mock gasps. Severus, quick! We have to stop using every single language on the planet! He declares, which causes Severus to choke down unexpected laughter. Phileas to turn purple with the effort of not cackling aloud, and for Minerva to spew tea onto her plate. Minerva wipes her face with her napkin while giving Nazar a stern look. You are going to be entertaining, aren't you, Professor Slytherin? If by entertaining you mean a complete pain in the backside, certainly, Professor McGonagall, Nazar replies. He smiles when Aurora says something rude under her breath about Slytherins, but there is far less heat to her words than there had been before. By gender not being a problem a thousand years ago, you mean what exactly? Poppy asks. He means that, ridiculous dalliances aside, we weren't using the word witch or wizard to describe those with magic the librarian Irma puts in testily. We were all using a variant on a Latin term, magician. That one has not a wit to do with one's personal bits, except for a few particular spells. Gender doesn't have a damned thing to do with magic, Nazar says. I really, really hated it when the old English terms for witch and wizard were snatched up and applied in the 1500s. Then by the 1700s, the dormitories were divided as if there were only two genders and only one means of having a relationship with another. It just got worse from there. Phileas is snickering. I told you, a natural teacher. Nazar stands up after draining his teacup. I confess nothing. Excuse me, I have to go ensure that most of you lose money this morning by decidedly not ter terrorizing all of my classes today. He left a note on the door of the old defense classroom on Sunday evening, directing everyone upstairs to that corridor on the seventh floor. At least students were already familiar with the tapestry of some odd magician by the name of Barnabas the Barmy, who was apparently trying to teach cave trolls to dance for reasons that completely escaped Nazar. He makes certain to arrive first, ducking into a hidden back stairwell that smells like centuries of dust with a hint of basilisk. Jaloff must have been using the passage to feast on Hogwarts' rodent population. Nazar doesn't use the stairs. He operates directly to the classroom and props open the door. He has a room full of modern student desks awaiting them when the first students file in, looking around curiously. Nazar leans against his desk, watching as they study the room, the empty, empty portrait frames, the torches, and Nazar himself. All four houses are combined in each lecture class, per year, which is a relief. He didn't want to repeat himself. His fifth-year Hufflepuffs and Ravenclaws seem fine with each other's company. It's the Slytherins and Gryffindors who are leery, bordering on hostile as they try to get as far away from their opposing house as possible. Nazar does nod at each greeting he receives from the ten Slytherin students, and a couple of students from the other three houses politely say hello. I didn't know there was a door in this hallway, Pansy says. I've never seen it before. It hides. I've no idea why, Nazar tells them, reminding himself that he needs to refer to a Slytherins by their family names, not their given name. Please, have a seat. We only have 50, minute, 50 minutes of class time, and we're going to make the most of it. Owen, please tell me who you are the first time I call on you if we've not met. 
I really need to be able to match faces to names. Once all 39 students of the fifth year batch have arrived, Nazar gestures with one hand to shut the classroom door. Hello. Thanks to the fact that magicians are the worst gossips I've ever encountered, you all know who I am, or you think you do. Properly introduced, I am Nazar Harifult de Leon, Casa de Deslizars de Castilla y Moravia. And first question goes to you, Hufflepuff. A young man with a shock of blonde hair blushes. Roger Malone, sir. Uh, where is Moravia? The Kingdom of Moray, which is where this school used to dwell before Scotland took over the entirety of the northern part of the isle, Nazar says, and moves on to his next victim. I'm Suli, sir. I don't get the Casa de Deslizars part. That's a Ravenclaw with features from the east. You'll have to ask her where her family is from for later, if only out of curiosity. In the school's first years, the primary languages in the region were Gaelic, which is now Irish Gaelic, Pictish, and Cumbric, both of which were in decline. The Gaelic speakers did all right with my family's name, but everyone else. Nazar smiles. Castilian names weren't common here. We compacted it to Dislizars in an attempt to keep some semblance of it, and it was still often turned into Slytherin, a word that made more sense to them. Sal Salazar and I both gave up after a few years and just let them use it. All of the Ravenclaws, Miss Granger, Vasey, Miss Greengrass, and a few other students light up like someone applied Lux to their blood. Can you speak those languages? Granger asks in excitement. Nazar shakes his head. I can't remember them. Old English, yes, but at least that survived. There was a disruption on the preservation charm that was supposed to make certain I didn't die in a painting. And a lot of my memories from the early centuries are gone. They'll come back eventually. But in the meantime, I own a lot of books that no one can read. Oh, speaking of books. Nazar gets out his wand long enough to cast a retrieval spell making a book appear on every student's desk. That's now your primary textbook for the year. Though you can refer to that other one if you need to. Your old book was largely rubbish, but it has some bits of useful information in it. We're going to be talking through this class period, sir, Malfoy ventures. Partly. I fell out of a portrait. There is no avoiding the fact that most of you won't be able to pay a bit of attention to the subject matter until the portrait part is dealt with. Nazar replies in a wry voice. For anyone who cannot take the suspense, living in a portrait for 978 years had a few interesting points and long stretches of interminable boredom. I don't recommend it. A Ravenclaw raises his hand. Terry Boot, sir. Why were you in a painting for nearly a thousand years? We'll get to that. Now, Nazar straightens up. Things that are relevant to this class. I was Hogwarts' first teacher who concentrated in teaching defense to students of all ages, of all houses. At the time, that was unusual, as students other were otherwise taught by teachers who shared their house once they were sorted. I designed this room to be what was needed, when I needed it, which varies depending on the lesson. My office is there. He gestures over his shoulder, and when I'm available, the classroom door will be open. If it's not, the door simply isn't there, and you'll know I'm unavailable. If it's an emergency, you can strike one particular brick on the wall outside four times, and the room will let me know. I'll show you that stone at the end of class. Now, after reviewing your original textbooks and hearing what, about what progress you've made, I'm very glad that none of you are dead yet. Nazar points when a dark-skinned Hufflepuff raises her hand. Yes, miss. It's Megan Jones, sir, and, uh, well, Cedric Diggory is last year. You're right. That was cruel of me to forget, and I apologize to everyone present in your house, Nazar says. However, he knew of no way to escape the killing curse. I hope to at least prepare you enough so that if you ever face the same situation, you have a better chance of survival. We're not that bad, a Gryffindor with a distinct Scots accent says. Shame is Finnegan, right? Nazar asks. Finnegan nods. Yes, sir. You know how to defend yourself against the killing curse, Mr. Finnegan. Uh, Finnegan looks alarmed by the question. Sabini frowns. Uh, but you can't, sir. Raise your hand if you share Mr. Zabini's opinion. Nazar resists the urge to swear under his breath when everyone raises their hands. Have none of you ever heard of ducking? Seeking cover behind solid objects? The killing curse cannot penetrate stone or metal, nor can it pass through hardwood bound in iron. You may have noticed that every door in this castle is constructed that way. 
Granger raises her hand. When should we have learned this, sir? It's an intelligent, intelligent question, even if it's frustrating. Your school governing board seems to frown on anyone teaching you a lot about real life in your first year, but you most certainly should have learned the basics of dodging any given spell cast in your direction in your second year. We kind of tried that, Tracy Davis offers. There was a dueling club for about a day, sir. An entire day. Nazar blinks a few times. Wait, is this the incident with the serpent and all of you panicking over a bit of parcel tongue? A great deal of the students in the room look abashed. Yes, sir, Finnegan says, wincing. Our defense teacher that year was rubbish. That would be Ron Weasley. Nazar has learned that if a student is a ginger, they're likely to be a Weasley. And so was the one before him, the one possessed by you-know-who. I'm Faye Dunbar, sir, the next Gryffindor says. Professor Lupin was excellent, but our parents didn't want him around because he's a werewolf. Everyone's gone daft in ten centuries, Nazar sighs, seeing fear on so many faces. Did Professor Lupin bite anyone during his teaching tenure? Did he ever deliberately endanger a student? Nazar watches as Granger and Weasley exchange nervous glances, but they don't say anything. Instead, it's Malfoy who pleads, Werewolves are dangerous creatures, sir. Were you bitten by Professor Lupin, Mr. Malfoy? Nazar asks. Malfoy ducks down in his seat. No, sir. Anyone else? Nazar waits as the class slowly shake their heads. Good. Stop insulting people with a contagious disease by calling them creatures, or I'll assign you a detention with your head of house. You can explain your lapse in common decency to them. Nazar waits until he sees disgruntled agreement on those faces who were previously fearful. The Slytherins will take more work, but they're not a lost cause. Moving along, then. This room has safeties that engage the moment that door shuts. The killing curse can be performed within these walls, but it will not kill anyone. Those same safety measures will prevent you from suffering fatal or permanent damage from any other spell that is cast, but you'll definitely be aware that in a real-world situation, you would be whimpering on the ground, dying or dead. I say this to warn you that you are desperately behind on the knowledge you should have gained at this point. And yes, I'm going by my standards, not your stupid, useless books. Bogarts and third year? That's first year introductory defense. You should all know how to duel properly by now. You should know how to cast a proper Patronus. You should know how to use your surroundings as a part of your defense. You should be ready to begin the basics of offensive dueling. Oh, and verbal defense is also supposed to be part of your studies, as are healing spells and mental self-defense. I've discovered that most of you are very, very bad at verbal defense, by the way. Anthony Goldstein, sir, a scowling Ravenclaw says when Nazar points at him. Then what does sixth year cover? Refinement of every lesson learned in previous years, Nazar answers. You should be ready to pass those ridiculously named NEWT tests in seventh year. You prove you've learned defense properly by teaching other students how to defend themselves. My brothers say seventh year defense is supposed to be about figuring out how it can apply to the rest of your life. Everything you learn in this school applies to the rest of your life, Nazar tells Weasley. Every single thing. If you want career counseling, go speak to your head of house. It isn't my job to make you employable. It's my job to see to it that you can defend yourself against any level of threat in the magical world, including that noseless corpse strutting around calling himself Voldemort. Nazar rolls his eyes at the gasps and the fear generated by saying that name. My however many times great grandnephew is not that terrifying. Just because he figured out a way not to die does not make him undefeatable. It makes him exceptionally inconvenient. Sir, uh, I'm Susan Bones. A nervous Hufflepuff says, Are you saying you-know-who is he's really back? Your headmaster told you as much last year. Nazar gives her a somber look and nods. Yes, he's back, and yes, he is a threat that you should take very, very seriously. However, before we continue, we have a few issues that I'm going to be addressing with every single lecture class I have today. Nazar lets his expression settle into a disappointed frown. All four of the founders would be very disappointed in the animosity between all of the houses in Hogwarts, but most especially the ridiculous, spiteful war occurring between Gryffindor and Slytherin. You can't know that, Crabbe says at once, looking smug. Nazar always did think the child was a few thoughts shy of a functional brain. 
Well, Godric was my friend, and Salazar was my brother. However, you don't need to take my word for it, right? Nazar glances over at the wall where the portraits are hung, watching as his lecture guests appear in their frames. Oh boy, not whispers wide-eyed. Fifth year, Hufflepuff, Slytherins, Gryffindors, and Ravenclaws. This is Rowan of Ravenclaw, Salazar, Slytherin, Helga, Hufflepuff, and Godric, Gryffindor. Nazar introduced them. Ages 41, 25, 27, and 32, respectively, though their portraits were updated to reflect the knowledge of each founder later in life. I have seen them around the castle, Boot exclaims. I just didn't realize who they were. That was the point. Rowena says dryly. Dryly. You're all used to our likenesses and painted in 1035. The portrait's found in the main hall downstairs. And for some reason, that lot of portraits hasn't aged well, Godric adds. They're either cranky, silent, or both. So you lot have not really had an introduction to who we really are. Your portrait, in particular, Sal, is not so personable, Nazar says. It spouts a lot of nonsense. Salazar shrugs. I've no idea what happened to that hermanito. Wow, Kala Shafiq smiles. You two really do look a lot alike. We heard that a lot, Salazar says, and then frowns at the Slytherins in the room. The nonsense you have been getting up to in recent centuries is disgraceful, and it's going to end. Brave and true does not mean hexter allies in the hallway when their backs are turned, Godric scowls. Where did you idiots get the idea that you're enemies? Because, because you are, uh, sir. Both of you. The sorting hat said you fought and Salazar Slytherin left Hogwarts because of it, Weasley says. Absolute rubbish, Godric replies. We had a disagreement, but it did not end our friendship even if he departed. Even if we had fought and parted on unkind terms, why would that mean your houses should be so divided? Even you, Badgers, are guilty in this. You shun other houses instead of showing them what you are capable of, or you retreat from them in fear. Helga lifts an eyebrow. Please do bear in mind that I am a Viking, my dears. Cedric Diggory was an excellent example of a true Hufflepuff, and you would all do well to remember that. And you. Rowena stares at the Ravenclaws in disapproval. You put your academic goals above all else, so you are easily fooled the moment an unkind word passes another's lips. True wisdom is being educated in all manners of life, not just scholarly pursuits. In short, please get your heads out of your asses, Godric says. Language, Godric, Nazar glares at the portrait. They're underage. Behave yourself. To the vexation and confusion of ten Gryffindors, Godric winces and nods. Right. Yes. Sorry, Nazar. Thank you. As for the rivalry between your house and Salazar's, I don't think anyone has an answer for that. Nazar can't even remember when the rivalry started. It's all he remembers, but he knows it wasn't always so. Then what did happen? Granger asks. <coughs> I left Hogwarts after a disagreement, yes, because Godric, Rona, and Helga were worried that my quest was in vain. I was seeking a way to help my brother in the task given to him to stop our descendant, nearly 1,000 years hence from destroying our world. Yes, we knew about Voldemort in our time, due to my talents at scrying, Salazar tells them. I have no idea if I succeeded. I am merely a portrait, a recording of what was before that departure. I thought, everyone has always assumed it was meant to be Harry's job to stop you-know-who, Granger ventures. Nazar scowls, putting such a burden on Potter's shoulders has caused a lot of trouble, and not just for P Potter. He points at Zabini. You! It has just become your sole responsibility to save the entire wizarding world. How do you feel? Zabini's dark skin turns pale. Like I'm going to need a new pair of pants, sir. I'm sure Mr. Potter felt much the same way all the time, Nazar says. Adults were expecting a child to save them, and they were not even giving that child a proper education in order to survive the experience. Everyone in the 20th century has lost their minds. Have we really? Bulstrode doesn't sound combative, just curious. I raised three children to adulthood, Nazar says. At age 14, when they began their magical apprenticeships and their chosen crafts, they do as much about defense as you should by your seventh year. And they were three years younger. Lucky for you, I'm here to fix it, 
It'll be fun. Weasley lifts the book and holds it in the air. This says it's written by someone named Bryce de Slizars. Why should we trust a book written by a Slytherin? Nazar glances at Godric, who is glaring at Weasley. Congratulations, Mr. Weasley. You've just insulted the founder of your own house. One of his Gryffindor girls raised, raises her hand. I'm Lavender Brown. Uh, sir, how? She asks since Weasley is on the verge of sputtering again. Bryce was Nazar's son, so you've insulted him, too, even if you won't speak of it. Godric growls. But Bryce de Slizars was my apprentice, you daft fools. He was very good at what he did, and he saved many lives. You complete git! Pravati Patil hisses at Weasley, who turns bright red. Sorry, Weasley mutters, trying to hide behind Finnegan and Granger. Nazar takes pity on him. Your grudging apology is accepted. Now, are there any other relevant questions before you all begin the hardest lesson you'll have for the rest of the semester? Hardest first, Vasey yelps. Nazar glances around the room. Yes, that way the rest of your year will seem easier in comparison. Think of it as a kindness, as you probably wouldn't wish to be trying to learn the hardest lesson in the middle of last minute studying for your OWLs. A lot of you should have learned the uses of basic incantation for casting a Patronus in third year and mastered it by the beginning of your fourth. You're two blasted years behind. That's NEWT level magic, Silly says. Only by shoddy standards, Nazar crossed his arms. Someone tell me what a Patronus is useful for. Granger is the first to raise her hand. They're the only defense against a Dementor, correct? Another? I'm Mandy Brocklehurst, sir, a Ravenclaw speaks up. You can send messages with a pro Patronus. Also correct. Anyone else? Cesar asks, it's not surprising when no one has an answer. If anything, Granger, Greengrass, and the Ravenclaws all look thwarted. Dementors are not the only creatures who fear a corporeal Patronus. Now let's talk about the incantation, its purposes, and the forms it can take, along with all the other magical creatures in our world who aren't fond of magical guardians. Nazar has seen all of Hogwarts 5th, 4th, and 3rd, and 2nd year students by lunch. He also wants to strangle whoever scheduled every single lecture class on the same day. Oh, that would be Dolores, Dumbledore informs them when Nazar mutters about it under his breath. I do believe she is trying to be efficient. By losing her voice every Monday. I'm sure that must have cheered everyone at dinner. Nazar says, Oh, she didn't spend her lecture bo blocks speaking. Heaven forbid she do something strenuous. Minerva puts her goblet down with far too much force. She would spend perhaps ten minutes speaking and then assign them reading. What about the second class? Nazar asks. Severus lives the infamous double set, if only because it's always Gryffindor Slytherin paired together. The very same thing, Minerva answers, two hours of reading and writing, and nothing else. The fork in his hand had been pewter instead of steel, he would have bent the thing in half. You are making me regret not killing that woman. You got her sacked, and she is awaiting trial. I am content with that, Minerva replies. You're late, Nazar says to Severus when he finally arrives. Severus sits down, a growl lodged in his throat. The Ravenclaws were in an experimental mood. The results were not favorable. Nazar looks in the direction of the Ravenclaw table and sees at least three singed faces. Oh, and how was your first morning of teaching? Severus asks, the faintest hint of a smirk on his face. I spent most of it talking while taking note of who is trying to kill whom. Aurora glances over at him, frowning. Is that really necessary, Professor Slytherin? Nazar raises an eyebrow. Do your students and do students in your classes point wands at each other? Well, no, Aurora admits. Exactly. Nazar lifts the tea he's been drinking, trying to decide if he actually wants the food on his plate. His appetite has been utterly soured by four hours of battling stubborn disbelief. Mine do, and there are a lot of rivalries in this school. Rowena is on the verge of losing her temper, and that was a very rare event. Rowena Ravenclaw. Phileas perks up, leaning forward in his chair to look at Nazar. I didn't notice the portraits missing from the main hall. They're not. I have my own. At some point, Nazar also needs to go yell at a drunken bit of felt sorting hat. You have your own portraits of the founders. Nerva is gazing at him in interest. I'd love to see them. Stop by the classroom on the seventh floor at... Nazar mentally reviews the timetable he's still getting used to. After four o'clock, you can talk to them all you like. 
You're going to have everyone who isn't teaching at that hour cramming themselves into your classroom, Severus warns him. They want to see the disappearing classroom anyway. The first year as Nazar sees after lunch is the easiest class yet. These students are too happy about Umbridge's departure to care overly much about who Nazar is, especially as they've not had time to soak in the house prejudices to the same extent. After that are the sixth years, the first NAWT group who could decide to take the class as an elective instead of as an acquire- requirement. Nazar thinks that is a stupid idea, considering how little an education these students receive in defense, but he can only help those who are in attendance. Few though they are, one Hufflepuff, four Ravenclaws, one Slytherin, and four Gryffindors. Nazar waits for the group to introduce themselves, which doesn't take long. Katie Bell, Kinjal Bhatia, Raquel Brown, Eddie Carmichael, Cho Chang, Marietta Edgecombe, Nandini Johar, Maxine O'Flaherty, Romani Roshan, and Jack Sloper. Ten of you. Well, that's depressing. Well, sir, after the Death Eaters last year, as our teacher, most of us were leery, Roshan says. Carmichael nods. Turned out we were right to be, what with the pink toad. Please stop being both misogynist and hateful towards toads, Nazar requests, trying not to rest his face in his hands. What does that mean, Sloper asks. Stop being a dick, Kinjal says flatly, and then tries to sink down in her seat. Uh, sir? I heard nothing, Nazar assures her, amused. I take it none of you learned anything of substance in the first two months of this term. How to hate pink cardigans and pictures of kittens, sir, Chang answers him, which causes three others to stifle sudden laughter. Having witnessed both, I don't blame you at all, and I happen to like cats. Nazar leans against his desk. Your first lesson is long overdue. How to cast a Patronus. Oh, thank God, Bill exclaims, then blushes. Uh, Nazar smiles. Still heard nothing. Today is theory, tomorrow is practice. The seventh years present him with a larger class, but only by two students. Tansom Appleby, Natalie Fairborn, Sarah Fosser, Herbert Fleet, Amrish Gupta, Angelina Johnson, Lee Jordan, Ona Parango, Purma Shah, Alicia Spinett, Fred Weasley, and George Weasley. Nazar repeats after a similar round of introductions. Two Hufflepuffs, only one Ravenclaw, three Slytherins, and six Gryffindors. Well, you lot are certainly living up to how stereotypes. How does everyone else have something does everyone else have something against learning defense? Not really, sir, Parango says. It's just that the other teachers in the subject have well been idiot, idiot, idiot possessed by you know who, fraudulent idiot, intelligent werewolf, death eater toad. George Weasley takes off on his fingers. We're taking bets on what sort of idiot you'll turn out to be, Professor. Do you want to learn how to cast a proper Patronus or not? Nazar asks dryly. Fred Weasley throws his hands into the air. Not an idiot! Spinet raises her hand. Who else is learning this, Professor? I ran into Katie Bell before class, and she told me you'd said it was a lesson long overdue. Third year's a nut, Nazar answers. Even under the old and really, really God's awful curriculum, you should have all learned this last year. I take it the infamous Death Eater didn't bother. Jordan tilts his head. Actually, he didn't even mention it. Probably wouldn't have looked good for him if he wasn't capable of demonstrating it, Nazar says. Can you demonstrate a Patronus, sir? Johnson gives him a challenging look that makes Shaw roll her eyes. Yes. Nazar considers it before he reaches up, hissing out a request that makes everyone but the Slytherins and most of the Gryffindors blanch. Quidditch with the parcel mouth, he asks them. The Weasleys nod in tandem. It's just the language, Fred says. No harm in a bit of hissing, George agrees. I suppose that just depends on who is doing the hissing. Nazar holds out his hand while Kanza scents the air, blinking at them in curiosity. Everyone meets their gaze at least once, though the wide grin on Shaw's face nearly makes the Hufflepuffs change their minds. Your Patronus is a snake, Professor, Fairborn asks politely. This is Kanza. She's an infant basilisk, Nazar says, and rolls his eyes when everyone but his Slytherins try to retreat without bothering to stand up first. You've all looked into her eyes, and none of you are dead or petrified. What does that teach you? That she's bad at being a basilisk? Appleby ventures. Kanza rears up and glares at the Hufflepuff. I am not. 
Don't insult the basilisk. It's bad manners, Nazar says. Fortunately, she has better manners than you, Miss Shaw. Since you looked forward to this moment so much, please inform your classmates about a specific trait a basilisk has. A basilisk has two sets of eyelids, sir, Shaw says, trying not to look pleased with herself. The first set reveals their eyes, and their gaze in that condition is harmless. The second set of eyelids hides the part of their gaze that can kill. Thank you. Nazar waits until his students begin to calm down. Another trait of a basilisk, without the interference of a fool such as, oh, Voldemort, he ignores the class-wide flinch. A basilisk is a protector. They're often tied to familial, familial bloodlines and guard those families. Or in the case of the basilisk, who lived here for 1,000 years without killing anyone, a school. Thank you, dearest, he says, allowing Kanza to return to her favorite place. Your Patronus is a basilisk, Fleet asks in disbelief. Yes, Nazar smiles. Do you still want to see it? Jordan is the first to nod. Fearless bloody Gryffindor. I might need new pants afterwards, but yes. Nazar gets out his wand and casts a spell non-verbally, watching their faces as the century-old basilisk Patronus appears. Anyone in need of new pants? Maybe, Fawcett says, blinking a few times in astonishment. The rest of her classmates are staring or gaping at the Patronus. Our protectors always terrifying. Sometimes it is a necessity to be so. Nazar dismisses his Patronus. Now you and your sixth year classmates have a challenge the other years do not. Once you learn to cast a corporeal Patronus, you then have to learn to cast it without speaking the spell aloud. There are things aside from Dementors who do not like Patroni, and giving away your intent would not be helpful. When the class is over, Nazar points to Gupta, Shah, and Punama in return, then points down at the ground to indicate that they stay. They gather up their things but linger as, the fo- as others file out of the classroom, all except for the Weasley twins. Out, Nazar says. George shrugs. We're trying to be fair. You call them your Slytherins. Wouldn't be all sporting if you and those portraits ask for a cessation of hostilities, and then report points behind the other house's backs, Fred says. Nazar gestures for the door to shut in a way that causes it to slam closed, making the twins glance at it in concern. The two of you have earned yourselves quite the reputation in your previous six years at Hogwarts. You're complete miscreants, who have also been observed to know what it means to be bloody well discreet. When I, so what I say to these three goes no further. The twins look at each other and nod. Sure, Fred agrees. That includes not telling family. George shrugs. We can't tell our mom even a third of what we get up to, Professor. We're sort of used to that. I'm sure she's very proud, Nazar says, and it turns his attention back to his Slytherins. Can any of you tell me why I only have muggle-born Slytherins in my NEWT level defense classes? muggle Fred starts to say, only to be cut off by his brother's hand over his mouth. Nazar nods at George in approval. Well, partly the shoddy teachers, Shaw says. Parango glares at Shaw. But mostly it's that pure-blooded idiots in our house want to learn the dark arts, not defend against them. Idiots is correct, Nazar mutters, pinching the bridge of his nose. If any of them ask what I'm teaching you, send them to me. You're not going to do their work for them. They think defense is so useless they can learn the hard way it is quite the opposite, or else their head of house wouldn't have been trying to get this job for the last ten years. What is Professor Snape saying about you getting the post instead of him, sir? Kupta asks. And the Tsar holds up his hands, fingers curled, as he's seen several years of students doing to quote another. Better you than practically anyone else, he says, and then gets three wide-eyed smiles wide smiles in response. Go on. Out. If you've another class, you don't want to be late. Are you too satisfied that I'm not being a miserable bastard behind your backs? Nazar asks after the others leave. The Weasleys look at each other again. Well, Fred begins, it's only one class. We're reserving judgment, but a Slytherin is still an improvement over a toad, George says. Umbridge was a Slytherin. Nazar gave them a faint smile when the twins stared at him. She's always been that way. With no useful head of house in her place, her behavior was ignored. I really hate how many students of my brother's house have gone out into the world and proved themselves to be truly horrid examples of humanity. I'm really appalled that I'm asking this, but are you all right? George asks. No. As our glances at the open door, you should go. You'll definitely be late for your next class at this rate. 
Nah, we're free for the rest of the day, Professor, Fred says. You didn't have to tell us that. Nazar shrugs. Lies are damaging. The truth is often much more youthful, if not more fun. <coughs> the twins exchange glances again. You know, maybe it's not a bad idea, Fred says. Certainly couldn't hurt, George turns to Nazar. Sir, we're sort of magical entrepreneurs, but we're getting into the sort of products we're experimenting on ourselves as potentially hitting dangerous territory. Magical entrepreneurs? Nazar lifts an eyebrow. Go on. We know from our older brother, Bill, that Slytherins often like the idea of an exchange, Fred says. You're a thousand years old, so we say, so say we handed you a, an idea or a formula. You'd be able to tell us if we would, it would do something that would have landed us in Azkaban. George nods, which, for obvious reasons, we'd prefer to avoid. You're both 17, Nazar asks, and they nod. All right, no promises, but I'll think on it. At 4.30, Minerva McGonagall knocks on the doorframe for his classroom. Is that offer still open? The door is open and the portraits are still there, so yes. Nazar coughs to clear his throat when his voice turns to a rasp at the end of the sentence. It looks like Godric and Helga are the only two still lingering, though. That's fine by me. Far less imposing than trying to deal with all four of them at once, I think, Minerva replies, and makes her way to the wall. Hello. Hello, head of my house, Godric replies cheerfully. Nazar leaves them to it. He's still trying to figure out how to retain a metamorph magist shift. If he can't retain a change, he can't bloody well teach it. Minerva peers into his office about a half hour afterwards. Oh, this is lovely, she says, glancing around at the shelves of books. Thank you. Nazar closes the metamorph magist text and resists the urge to fling it at the wall. It isn't the book's fault that his memories are lacking. Are you the only one? Minerva nods. None of the others came to see this place. I think they found the idea intimidating. Nazar sighs. Oh, of course. Well, too bad. The portrait frames are going back in my quarters this evening. They'll have to content themselves with attempting to track down the portraits when they're wandering about in other frames. You didn't tell them it was a one-time offer, Minerva says. Nazar gives her an innocent look. They didn't ask. Hmm. Minerva gives him a look that is attempting to be disapproving without quite making it there. Dinner is at six, Professor Slytherin. Are you going to be so formal all the time, Nazar asks. It seems awkward. One never knows if another will take offense to at a lack of formal address, Minerva replies prim primly. I'm not offended. My name is fine unless we're needing to be impressive and terrifying in front of students, Nazar says. She smiles. Then I am Minerva, Nazar, unless we need to be terrifying and, impress and impressive, of course. I definitely understand why Severus likes you. Nazar stands up to put the book away. See you at dinner, Minerva. Nazar waits until she's gone, and the classroom door is shut before he moves the portrait frames back into his quarters. And what did a Gryffindor head of house wish to speak with you about, he asked Godric, who was the only one still lingering. She was intriguing, Godric says, untying his hair from the strict tail he always kept when trying to be formal or intimidating, if not both. She wished to know more of what you of you than she did of me. And what did you tell her? Godric wigs until he finishes hanging Helga's frame. Minerva wanted to know more of your role in the castle during our time. I told her that you were the castle's defender and defense teacher. She asked what I meant by defender. I said it was your title. Title, Nazar frowns. Protector. Exactly. Godric gives him a curious look. Do you recall what that means? No. Yes. Maybe. Nazar bridges the bridge of his nose again, trying to decide if he has a headache or if he's just unused to talking through the entire day. Is this something I should ask about or just worry about it later? Little of both, I suspect. Godric says, for now, merely think on this. If Hogwarts came under attack, we all fought, but who coordinated the defense? Nazar drops his hand. Fuck, he whispers. I did. Exactly. We'll speak more later, Nazar, Godric says, and vanishes. Why did all four of you spend a thousand years learning to be cryptic, Nazar asks in irritation. Honestly, a straight answer is not that difficult. 